Hello, everyone. Welcome to day two of AI for 2020 Finance Edition. We are really excited to have two special guests from Microsoft. We have Travis and Charles here. And in just a minute, they're going to take it away with some self introductions and then begin their presentation. So, guys, if you are able to turn on your microphones and videos and explain who you are just for a second and then take it away. I know the audience is really excited for this. Perfect. Daniel, thank you for the intro. Uh, we're excited to be here. Uh, hi, everyone. I'm Travis Nixon. I'm the National Director for Data Science Financial Services at Microsoft. Uh, last year, I had the privilege of attending AI for Finance, uh, and so just really excited to be in, here and actually take part in the programming of AI for. So looking forward to it. Charles? Yeah. Hey everyone, I'm Charles Morris. Uh, I'm a data scientist and cloud solutions architect at Microsoft. I was also at AI for Finance last year. Really excited to be giving a talk this year. I really love focusing on end-to-end -end machine learning scenarios and, and kind of helping teams get better just across the board with the data science. So we'll talk a little bit about that during our talk today as well. As you can tell from Charles's hand motions, he's cooler than I am. Yeah, I'm super cool. <laughs> <laughs> All right, well, I'm going to go ahead and share my screen and get started here. So... Charles, can you let me know when you can see my screen? Yeah, you're good. All right, perfect. And would you mind taking your mouse and putting it at the bottom? Great, thank you. All right, so today Charles and I are gonna talk about fairness and transparency in artificial intelligence, an essential topic. So for a long time, uh, transparency methods for machine learning and artificial intelligence have been kind of really nice to have things uh, in the early days, they were a little bit fringe. Some people knew it. It was the cool snazzy thing. These days, it's a lot more uh, popular to talk about and, and look at. I'm going to posit that for ML and AI practice going forward, every model should be looked at through a transparency methodology. Um, and every process, every time you build a model, your process to build that model should be completely transparent. There's a lot of breach and trust in the tech world these days with data, privacy, with whether or not models are biased. It's an enormous problem. And that's exactly what we're going to talk about today. So I think that the methods we're going to talk about are essential to ensure that ML and AI continues the growth in usage, in trust, in capability that it's seen for the last few years. So with that, I'm going to start uh, describing exactly what benefit there is to start looking at this. I, I mean, obviously, we know AI is huge, right? Uh, when I first started at Microsoft, we thought AI could be worth $40 billion uh, worldwide. Uh, over the last few years, that $40 billion has turned into $3.9 trillion. So in the early days, people thought AI might be hype. Uh, who knows where it would land? Um, but what we've seen in the outcome is not only was it not hype, it was, it's way bigger than we ever would have imagined because it turns out machine learning and AI is not just some fringe technology that people can use and it makes some cool gadgets. It turns out that it can be an underlying enabling technology across every piece of an organization, of every organization, really. So $3.9 trillion of value, which is great. We're seeing adoption. We're seeing innovation. We're seeing iteration on where AI can go. The problem is, as companies embrace this, we need a solid mindset on the ethics and usage of AI in order to make sure that the entire industry doesn't get caught up into uh, some, some problems that are bubbling up. So I'm going to describe it this way. So a lot of data scientist teams do a lot of work. They build a model cool algorithms being invented all the time. They have the perfect model, okay? They go and they deploy it. And they're really excited about the math that underlies the work that they just did. And when they deploy it, all their users react with anger, disgust, mistrust, uh, and you're just not getting the reception you thought you would. So this happens often enough that we put some time to understanding why user adoption and deployment would be such a sticky mess as it sometimes is. And the reason it comes down to really five issues that we've identified. First, the model's not trusted. So you can imagine this business group has been doing things a certain way for 20 years and doing it by, you know, leading through their gut and how they feel about the data. And so this model's coming in and they're disappointed that their gut feelings are no longer going to be what leads the enterprise. So you've got to prove the model is better than their gut. 
it's unused because people are intimidated by AI. They don't know exactly how to use these products and integrate them with their applications. It's inaccurate because the data you use to train the model doesn't match the data in the real world. It's deviating because the real world is changing anyway and you trained on historical data. So you need now need to put in a lot of hours just maintaining models that are already out there and it's biased. So not only is it unethical, it's also a huge problem for the brand of the company. So these five things come in and you go from the perfect model to the perfect storm. And what we want to talk about today is three strategies, three toolkits that are available to everyone today for free, open source on GitHub uh, in order to ameliorate these problems. And we're going to talk about the Interpret ML uh, platform, the FairLearn repository, sorry, not platform, and the data science lifecycle process, which is also a repository. And Charles was really humble in his introductions. Actually, Charles gained notoriety by being the founder and innovator behind the data science lifecycle process. So really excited we could get him here with us today to walk us through that. So, all right, let's talk about interpretation, uh, interpret ML. Broadly speaking, data scientists, we know everything on the screen here, right? These are the algorithms available to us to attach to a data set and get the right output, right? Top left-hand corner, we're talking about our black box methods. Boosted trees, random forest, neural networks, we all know they're good, they're accurate, we like to use them. Problem is they're not explainable. And so um, getting, yeah, you can get feature importances easy enough out of random forest, right? But what we need is the ability to look at one prediction, one localized prediction and say, here's exactly how we arrived at that prediction. And that's just not something that's easy with those black box models. It's a lot easier with the models in the bottom right hand corner, your linear regressions, your decision lists. But at the same time, those just don't give us the accuracy we need to actually forge a path forward for the enterprise. So it's a damned if you do, damned if you don't decision, especially in the context of financial services where regulators are not just suggesting we use explainable methods. They are requiring that if we're going to deny someone a loan, uh, that we be able to explain exactly what it was about their profile that caused them to be denied. Microsoft has poured a lot of money and time into making a new algorithm that we can use right now. And it has the benefit of sitting up in the top right hand corner of this graph. So it's fully explainable, just as much so as a linear model. And it has the accuracy of uh, boosted trees. It's actually a really cool tool. Something I hope you can all start using today. Again, it's completely open source. Everything we're talking about today is open source. Okay. Should we give them a loan? I want to talk about EBMs. I, I can get into the mathematics, but you know, really honestly, the GitHub repo is going to be able to lead you through step by step everything much better than I could. What I want to talk about today is when, where, and why you should use this. So we're going to talk about this in a concrete example of whether or not to give someone a loan. Okay. Again, this problem is important to consider in light of the fact that if we don't have local explanations for our models, regulators just aren't going to allow us to utilize these methods. So we have four pieces of data to make a determination of whether or not to give a loan to someone. We know their income, we know their credit score, we know how long they've been a customer with us, and we, we know demographic data about them. And so I'm just going to make up some variables here. This is a made up problem just to lead us through the example. Uh, but let's say we have sex, we have uh, age, we have gender, we have uh, sexual orientation. Okay, so all those variables that you want to make sure your models aren't biased on, in other words. And then we're going to make a business decision. So in this model, what we're going to get is an output where we're judging the percent likelihood of defaulting on a loan by customer A. Okay, so if the chance of default is above 13%, we're going to say no, we're not going to extend the loan to you. Below 13%, great, they're a new customer. Okay, so let's walk through the models available to us today in order to accomplish that task. First, we have our linear regression models. These are nice, comfortable. We get an output with coefficients, with p-values. We understand everything that's going on inside that model. It may or may not be good, but we actually, you know, at least understand what's been optimized. Second, we have these black box models. Okay, so these two models give us a very different picture of what to do with customer A. In the top one, he or she has an 8.3% chance of default. Yay, give them the loan. In the bottom one, 20.7% chance of default. Definitely do not give them the loan. Same customer, okay? And the problem is we don't exactly know which model to go with until we do an assessment of accuracy. We see the black box model is way closer to the on the ground truth. We want to deny the loan, but the problem is we can't explain on a localized basis what's going on in that model. So we have to pick the linear regression. And we have customers like this 
all the time where they say, we know we don't want to give loans to these people, that they're a bad risk. But at the same time, we have to because we can't explain what's going on in our models. So they're just leaving money on the table. This happens in insurance. This happens in capital markets all the time with uh, stock risk and things like that, right? So how do we go forward? Let's talk about what the world looks like through an EBM or explainable boosting machine. You'll end up with a picture that looks something like this. So you have your base value where if you know nothing about a customer, there's a 32% chance that they will default, okay? Then we're gonna draw our business decision where if they end up below this yellow line, we're gonna say yes, above, no. First variable, we know that customer B has a high income. Great. Not only do we know that this lowers their risk, we actually know by exactly what percentage this lowers their risk, which is very powerful, 13.5%. We know they have a good credit score. Again, lowered risk of 6.5%. We know they've been a customer for five or more years. Lowered risk, 2.3%. But now we have those demographic variables that I talked about, the ones that you don't want to bias your model against. So things like gender, race, sexual orientation, whatever it may be in your specific business environment, okay? Now those variables, it just turns out that for customer B, uh, increase their risk, okay? So now at the outset, or at, at the end of the day, 14.8% chance of default, we're gonna de deny them the loan. But I wanna talk about those three variables specifically. That's a real problem. And we've seen this be a problem for companies before. So I've eliminated the name here from this news article clipping. I have tremendous respect for this company, okay? But, they got in serious trouble from having a credit card that gave worse interest rates to females than to males. And uh, clearly this did damage to the brand. They had to go back and refigure these models uh, and make sure that there was no bias in them. Um, not a situation you wanna be in. So how do EBMs allow us to avoid that situation? Well, we can identify those variables. Now you don't wanna just, you could, through one lens, and it used to be best practice uh, in the past, to say, you know what, I'm just not gonna include those variables in the regression to begin with, or in the model to begin with. Uh, and that way I know that my model's not basing its weight off of them. The problem is those variables have a way of sneaking in to other variables and you catch them through proxy effects anyway. So actually removing those variables in the beginning is not a good practice because you could make a biased model just as easily, right? You want to have those variables in your analysis, but what you wanna be able to do is just eliminate the impact of those variables. So now you know you've teased out the effect in the original and the other variables, and you've eliminated the bias in your model that are represented in those variables. So now we have a very different picture of customer B. In fact, the model is saying that we should approve them for the loan, okay? so. This allows us to basically have the accuracy of those black box models, but at the same time, control for what's going on in our models. And this isn't just powerful from a bias perspective, this is also powerful from a business objective perspective. So even beyond bias, you really wanna be going through these methods. Uh, to highlight the impact of this, we did some work with the CDC where we evaluated what's the mortality risk of pneumonia, right? Um, this is a, a very timely kind of model, you could say. It was done through a neural network, black box method. Whole bunch of variables, medical history, demographic data, professional activity, scary accurate. You would know why you would want these models because you go into a doctor, they could input patient information and get an understanding of, you know what, you have pneumonia, but you have a low overall risk profile. So I'm not gonna prescribe harsh medications because there's a lot of side effects. Whereas if you had really extreme uh, risk factors for uh, pneumonia, maybe you would wanna go with those harsh medications and get through the side effects because the risk factors for pneumonia are high enough to justify it. So we took that black box model and we decided to introduce it to our transparency methods and see what was going on inside of it. We ended up with this picture. Okay, so uh, broadly speaking, the higher up you go in this graph, the worse off you are. Okay, so at the end of that waterfall chart, you wanna be low. A green, good, low patient mortality. So you have your base value just like we had before, but you also want to consider the first thing we saw was the patient had asthma. Uh, then you have the demographic effects and then you have the professional activity. Asthma is not something that should be decreasing risk. Right here we see that having asthma really decreases your risk of dying from pneumonia. That's terrible. 
So we went in and with our EBMs, we were able to adjust the weights within the model and correct for that. And at the end of the day, you see that asthma has a completely different picture. And you can understand why the model was picking up that effect to begin with. Who is the patient portfolio that is most likely to seek medical attention right off the bat as soon as they notice something's wrong with their breathing? Someone with asthma, someone that's paying attention to their breathing anyway. So yeah, they might actually have a lower profile risk, but that's not specific to their actual portfolio. That's specific to the uh, world around which we don't have data accommodating for. So we needed to make a correction to our model. And that's what these EBMs allow us to do. Very powerful. Really suggest you take a, an in-depth look at that. Now, let's talk deeper about fairness and, and the Fair Learn package specifically. I'm going to hurry us up along so make sure Charles has a good amount of time to, to talk through his piece. But Fair Learn is a package that allows us to hone in on a specific uh, group uh, in our data set and say we want to make sure our data is or our model is not biased in the outcome for this group. So you can see the first picture it gives me is the accuracy of my model between these two groups. Uh, there's a lot of reasons why you would want to make sure they're accurate. Uh, please reach out to me and Charles. Uh, we'd love to develop the conversation further. This is an important screen, uh, but I need to hurry us along. Uh, essentially, you want to make sure that the outcome is not weighted in favor of one group versus the other. So here we're seeing that the males are receiving the favorable outcome. They're receiving the, the loan at twice the rate that females are. So we can manually adjust for this and say, well, you know, take the male percentages and, and raise the threshold for them. But then your model accuracies really start to hurt. So where Fair Learn starts to help you is you can instantiate a battle royale in your models where here's five different models, the dots on this graph, the higher up you go, the greater bias there is in the model. The further to the right you go, the more accurate your model is. Now, sometimes if you straight up just have a trade-off between accuracy and fairness, you'll see all the dots line up on this 45 degree line. But that's not the case here. Actually, in this uh, setup, we were able to achieve the best accuracy and the lowest bias in our model right here. Very, very powerful toolkit. Again, suggest you take a deeper look at it uh, in the links that we'll attach. Uh, and here's what we ended up with. We we're able to get a better model, more accurate, and at the same time, reduce the disparity between male and female outcome predictions. Okay, so uh, I want to now hand it over to Charles and lead us through transparent processes in designing these models through the data science lifecycle process. Charles? All right, cool. Uh, thanks, Travis. So yeah, Travis talked us through like, why do you want interpretable models, right? It's obviously because, you know, um, you need to understand what your models are doing, right? We're, we're getting to the point where black box and just pure performance metrics aren't enough, right? So, but if you take that a step further, it's not enough just to have your models be interpretable. You actually, in order to really understand the model, need to understand the process that went behind creating it, right? Real and quick, if you, uh, Charles, yeah. if you wouldn't mind moving your mouse. Oh, yep. Perfect. Oh. Yeah, so we really want the trends, the the process to be transparent as well, because that's the only way we're gonna be able to really understand what went into building a model. So when you're at a conference like this, you'll often see like, you'll often hear a story like with this data science happy path, right? Where, um, you know, you'll start with asking a question and then you'll get some data back. Uh, you work through it, you build a model and then you deploy it and you communicate your results to the business. It's a great success, problem solved. Now you're at the conference talking about the great story. Now, the problem with this is it's obviously oversimplified. And it, for the conference, this is a great great story to have because people just care about what your success was, right? But this is only something we can figure out after the fact. We have this through line of steps that we took that were successful. But in order to get to these steps, this six, uh, sequence of successful steps, we have to try a lot of things first. So if I walk you through this, right? Um, essentially, let's say you start out by you get some customer data that you have in your data warehouse or your uh, systems and things like this. And the first thing you're going to do is you're going to explore the data and try to understand the distributions and things like that. Uh, let's say after you do that, the first thing you do is you try to predict churn on these customers. Um, but you know what, after you work through it, you're, you're unable to get anything meaningful. Uh, but while you were doing that, you actually noticed that there were a lot of double entries in your data. So you're trying to understand what that was. Uh, so then let's say you work through your team and you're actually able to like um, unpack why those double entries are there and fix them. You're going to try another experiment. And this time you're going to only try to predict one year churn going out, right? It's a more specific experiment. Uh, but it turns out that you can't 
you can't do that. Just uh, you're not getting the results that you need in order for it to be valuable enough. But someone else on your team goes and tries an experiment where they actually limit it down to the premium customers. Um, and they actually find that they're able to predict the churn for the premium customers really well. And that, that is a model that they can run with in production, right? So now what happens is what actually gets pushed to your code base is you have the data pool and you have the successful experiment. All the other stuff is no longer in your code base, right? So what you end up with is as you try more things and you do more exploration and more experiments, you're going to have a ton of things you tried. And only after the fact, you're going to have this through line of what you actually did that was successful. Now, most of the time, this is all we want, right? Because we just care about what's in production and what's useful. We don't care about all the failed attempts until something breaks. And then it's really important that we're able to go back and recreate at a moment of time how we got to that decision, how we got to that point. So we want to be able to draw this through line because if we don't understand how our models got built or the decisions that went into them, it's hard for us to explain to others, whether it's our um, business partners, whether it's our team, or whether it's regulators, uh, why did the model go awry? Now, how do we actually solve for this? So essentially we do two key pieces here is uh, one is we start using issues for defining our defining and organizing our work. So we actually use issues inside of GitHub um, to define what we're going to be doing and, and say, oh, this is what we're trying next. And the second is we actually came up with a branching strategy that complements the data science workflow, the sort of cyclical experimental nature of data science. So to give you an example of what like an, one of these issue templates would look like, uh, this is what we call an ask issue. And this is where you actually define your problem. Uh, and you start by defining it from a business perspective of what metrics you're trying to actually accomplish. And then slowly, over as you start writing this ask issue, you can turn that into a technical problem and figure out what technical metrics you need to optimize to do that. Um, as for the branching strategy, we basically took GitHub flow and extended it for data science specific use, use cases. So we introduced these four new branching patterns, data, experiment, explore, and model. And those help you actually navigate the different pieces of data science process. So you know what should you mer merge to your main branch and when. Uh, and just an example, I'm not gonna go through all of them, but an example of this would be if you're running an experiment, most of the time your experiments don't pan out. So for every experiment, you're gonna create an experiment branch, but only if an experiment is successful um, are you going to spend the time actually refactoring that and, and doing things? So you're going to do the experiment branch. Then when it's successful and it goes through a uh, peer review request, uh, it'll go through your modeling branch. And then you'll be able to enter build mode where you just take that model and get it production ready. And then you, at the end, you can integrate with your ML ops processes. So at the end of the day, we ended up with this thing called the data science lifecycle process, um, where we take these issue templates and workflows, this branching strategy, and combine it with artifact management and ML ops to have this end-to-end -end data science process. And it turns out that the same process that allows you to have transparency in how your models got built is the same process that makes your team more effective and have faster iteration times. So we think there's a lot of value here. This is an open source process that we put on GitHub documenting how to work through it. Um, and yeah, so essentially what we talked about was how to debug your models and how to understand what your models are doing and how they're making decisions, how to address the uh, impacts of your models through Fairlearn, and DSLP is a process that you can use to make your teams more transparent and more effective. And we have this set of resources and all these great links, so you can go and check these things out to yourself. We're really happy to be here. We think that interpretability and transparency as we enter this maturity phase of data science is going to be uh, a must-have. So we're hoping that we can help you get started on your journey. And we really appreciate the AI4 people for inviting us to give this talk. Uh, th thanks again. Wonderful opportunity. Thank you for inviting us. And we're looking forward to continued dialogue. Wow, thank you guys. That was amazing. A big virtual round of applause for Travis and Charles, everyone. Great job, guys. You can pause on the screen sharing. And for all the attendees out there, Go ahead and do some virtual networking and stick around. We have some great finance content coming at you later. All right.